Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is uh, Jeroen Warner. I'm the coordinator of the EduSyn project, uh, a European-funded project on cities, catas catastrophes, and cultures, in which we try to understand the role of culture in disaster, not only as something that can be problematic, uh, but also as something that can be an asset when uh, working with disaster-affected people in the preparation and the response phase. We are working from uh, Wageningen University in the in the Netherlands um, as coordinators, and we are joined by uh, 10 to 11 partners in Europe. Um, uh, seven cities are uh, mostly in southern Europe are involved. Uh, one in the north, uh, the city of Dordrecht in the Netherlands, and uh, research organizations, game makers, um, water managers, all kinds of people from different social sectors exchanging information and, uh, and experiences to get better at handling the issue of disaster and culture. The program for today, we'll uh, soon introduce ourselves and hope that you would uh, do the same. And while you say who you are, um, please also think if there is a topic that you would like discussed in this uh, first webinar uh, of EduSend. What kind of topic is uh, close to your heart uh, or your work uh, that you would like to discuss uh, on uh, disaster and, um, and culture? Uh, what kind of question would you like to ask of the others uh, so that you uh, can work better or research better on uh, disaster and culture? Um, despite our project having started last year, we still haven't quite worked out how to the, uh, how to empirically define culture. There are plenty of textbook definitions, but how do you actually define culture before it flies you in the face, before it hits you and makes you say, ouch, as uh, uh, our team member, uh, Peter Thomas, uh, Peter Thomas tends to say, uh, how do you ask a, a fish about the water they swim in? It's not so easy to talk about culture, but you know it when you feel it. But let's see how we can make it operational and in and practicable uh, also with a view to our major project output which is an ebook uh, a, 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 a kind of handbook to help practitioners uh, work with disaster and culture i'm joined by uh, three ladies in this room um, first uh, our deputy project manager Lieke van der Zouwen. Uh, you already heard her voice starting this uh, this webinar Soon you'll hear and see uh, Karen Engel. She's finishing her PhD on disaster culture, uh, both in South America and in Europe, two cases, earthquakes, floods. And there's Mona Regat, who is uh, supporting us as a kind of intern and will be taking notes in case needed and is, will also join us in the conversation. That's, uh, that's us. And then the question is, who are you? I think most people who are now um, uh, participating are part of the EduSend project. Please, um, we're going to open the, the phone, uh, the floor. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and see what your topic question is that you would like discussed in, your, uh, in this seminar? After that, we will have the two presentations. First, by uh, myself. Uh, a few slides on uh, introductory uh, culture and interculturality, and then from Karen Engel, more specifically on culture in the VRR. Um, shall we open the floor, or is it already open? Who's first? Okay, well, since most of you are people from our own consortium, we, we already know each other. But um, rather than introducing yourself, it would be useful if you uh, would tell us what you would like to get out of this or what, what you would like to know, what you want us to tell about culture. And uh, so what, what are your questions uh, or what do you want to hear from us? And uh, then uh, Jeroen and Karen, they can um, adjust their presentations to your specific questions. So just click uh, ask a question in case uh, you have questions and then uh, 
we will uh, maybe answer them. Here's the first one. Omona. Yes, um, Lika and Karen, hello. I was um, yeah, I was interested in um, when you send the invitation. How do you? Why do you frame it as culture in urban disasters? What is so special about the urban setting that you were you were questioning the idea of culture? Is that a specific urban culture that might impact the way people respond in disasters? Thank you very much. Other other questions? If not, I will address your question first now. Um, the easy answer is it is about European cities, um, the topic. But of course, there's a reason why we, we chose this topic. Um, most people now in the world live in cities, more than 50%. And most people who live in cities are fairly recent arrivals. Um, but especially those who are, for example, second or third generation urban dwellers have often lost the kind of urban survival skills that they need to, uh, to survive in a longer periods of discomfort, of upset. So while people in the countryside may be used to storing up on, on uh, wood, logs, uh, fuel, on, uh, on food, uh, on, on have big... Uh, Big machinery to take the snow off your uh, of your house or uh, take away uh, fallen trees or whatever uh, obstacles there might be in cities. People do not have that, and um, because people are more densely um, populated, more densely packed together in a urban situation, often that's a multi-story housing. When something goes wrong, it goes wrong for a lot of people. And it's not so easy to uh, uh, to to save them, uh, especially if there is a kind of quick onset disaster like an earthquake. So urban disasters have their own dynamics, specifically to do with little space and many people, and the strong dynamics of um, uh, of disaster. At the same time, ur urban areas are hotbeds of entrepreneurship and innovation, or can be, so that they're if new things, new ideas develop often, it happens in cities. So that makes the ur urban, among other reasons, pretty, pretty special. Okay, um, I think I'll start my presentation. Uh, it's in PowerPoint form. And if you should have questions anyway, then please use the chat function so that we uh, can give you the floor. We'd like to make it as interactive as, uh, as possible. So if all is well, you now see in your, uh, on your screen uh, the Edusen logo uh, developed by Kunda uh, Atun for our uh, prison, uh, our, our, our work, which is a very nice looking three colored, three, four colored, uh, four leaf clover, uh, as well as the European uh, framework one. So um, that is our project. However, the, the slides that you see have been devised by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Bram Janssen, who also works in, in, in the disasters uh, studies uh, subgroup of uh, the social sciences group in Wageningen. Uh, Bram gives a presentation, re regularly give presentations on uh, what is culture in unity humanitarian aid in crisis situations, and we found them uh, helpful and we were allowed to use them, but Bram couldn't uh, join us today, uh, to explain some, uh, some introduction to uh, how to recognize uh, disasters before they hit you in the face. So culture can be described as a system of knowledge, norms, beliefs, and symbols as the terms through which groups understand and interpret the world or institutional arrangements within which social life takes place. Culture, cultural studies tend to fall into two categories. One is 
to understand the objects. Why are why do certain objects, rituals, symbols look the way they do, which include memorials, uh, landscape uh, uh, signs of how high the, the flood was in, in, in the Dutch case, 1953 or 1926. Um, but there's another one which I guess we are most interested in, and that's culture as uh, reasons behind behavior, why people behave in a certain way and interact in a certain way with each other. Things that make you from culture A think, why do they in culture B do that the way they do? And how have they organized, institutionalized these, uh, these behaviors in institutions? A lot of culture is you, uh, what you don't see at uh, at surface glance, it is you only see and experience the tip of the iceberg, as represented in this particular uh, slide. You see overboard, above board. You see a certain um, aspects of culture that you don't see but feel, especially a clash of values, which is the the, the bottom line uh, in the uh, the iceberg, the underwater part of the iceberg. Uh, which are where it's very hard to convince the other. When people have different values, it's it's often something that they are quite attached to. So when, when you interact with each other, when you negotiate with each other, you can talk about interests, you can talk about uh, the look and feel of things, but values are often non-negotiable. Uh, so you better respect them and deal with them rather than trying to change them. It's very hard to change someone's core values. As I already said, uh, it's hard to ask a fish why and how uh, he swims in particular water. That's just what they do. Uh, it's because it seems normal. Some like hot water, some like cold, some like turbid water, some like clear water. Uh, that's just how they have come to act and some nature, some nurture aspects. The way that things are done around here is uh, what people feel and intuitively do as, uh, as expressions of culture. That means that if you think that certain things are normal, then whatever others do differently may seem to be the wrong way. Why don't people just do it like us? And in interaction between cultures, these are the things that most obviously are different and annoying or surprising or intriguing. So there's a normal level of otherness, which we kind of ex uh, ex accepts, uh, which facilitates routine and social organization. But of course, there's also cultural difference that uh, annoys and frustrates, that brings taboos or that brings uh, alienation. And we're also interested in the kinds of cultural expressions that fascinate because they are so useful, helpful, uh, the kind of cultural repertoires that people have developed uh, in response to disasters. The cultural Identities often come from a response to disaster that people are repeatedly uh, exposed to, like the Dutch identify with the, the fight against uh, the water, the this, uh, storms, uh, floods and river floods, and uh, others may identify with repeated earthquakes or droughts uh, or uh, volatility of the weather that people have become accustomed to and take pride in being able to live where they live and live the way they live. But that brings certain behaviors that uh, someone who has not been exposed to, to that uh, environment does not relate to. It is very easy to stereotype culture, uh, but actually it is too simple to say the Italians are like this and the Dutch are like that. Even in the confines of our own project, we regularly clash to, uh, about how things we things seem to be typically Dutch, typically Swedish, typically Italian, but it's good to realize that culture is highly dynamic and constantly changes. So what seemed typically Dutch 20 years ago has already changed and the same goes for other cultures and the same goes for organizational cultures because so far I've identified national cultural differences, which is what people tend to talk about when they talk about cultural differences. But of course, there is also different layers of, of cultural difference, uh, subcultures between even cities or towns uh, a few miles apart may have a very different way of dealing with their environment and with each other, uh, which 
I guess Karen will uh, respond to in, in a second. And um, between organizations, the firemen and uh, policemen may have a very different idea when they talk about uh, particular uh, routines that they're used to, particular things that they see as dangerous. Like, do you lock all the doors or to keep the, uh, the, the, the villains out? Or do you keep all the doors and windows open in case of a fire that everybody can escape? These very simple uh, examples may uh, illustrate how the how people work actually ident make people identify with different aspects and may uh, pro pro promote different behaviors and have shorthands for the things that they think that is clear to everybody, but often turns out to be not. So then we're in the domain of interculturality of how different cultures interact with each other, uh, clash or meet uh, in their interaction, which especially is relevant in times of crisis when a lot of people have to work together in a very short time span. And as our team before this session already discussed, um, that is too late to try and identify cultures. You already should have an idea what kind of cultures you may engage in a disaster because a disaster itself is too late to learn about culture, except for a very rapid uh, intuitive response. So in the preparation um, phase, we should work out what kind of cultures, what kind of differences we may encounter in dealing with others in the domain that we work with, both with colleagues and with possible disaster victims and others who may be volunteers or gatekeepers. So a lot of misunderstandings can uh, happen in this so-called trading zone between different organizations or different subcultures. Because we see our environment, our fellow human beings, and ourselves through particular lenses. We frame it in a particular way. It's, 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 it's uh, influenced by our own cultural background, and we have come to see it uh, as normal. But actually, we determine each other's realities. And so the moment that we interact with them, other people's framing of us may change. And our uh, identity may even change in the process as a consequence of repeated interaction with each other in a positive or negative way. So one thing that you can do as uh, in preparation to uh, understanding cultures and possible clashes or encounters between cultures in a disaster situation is some ethnographic fieldwork to understand by immersion by repeated exposure, uh, close-up study of social and cultural environment of everybody around you uh, who is who seems or could be different from you, uh, act differently, look differently, have different uh, points of references. There are more qualitative approaches uh, such as interviews and mixed methods, something that we've also tried to do within Edison and uh, participant observation, but also more experimental things, for example, uh, what we've tried to do uh, in, within the, our project in uh, inciting cultural memory, for example, by organizing a, a exhibition or by games. And our Polish partners are very good at um, making these games to or selecting these games and adapting them. Uh, they don't always have to be developed from scratch. Uh, to emphasize, to immerse yourself in the experience of interaction with others, with different cultures. I think this is the last slide. Um, when you're trying to help out people in an area that you don't know, you need to have access to them. Our colleague, uh, colleagues in, in uh, Milan have experienced this, trying to get access to the Turkish community. If you just send a letter or email uh, or send a leaflet, that doesn't work. Uh, people are not necessarily going to trust you and feel comfortable with you. So you need other strategies to get access um, in, and enter into communication, uh, information and uh, an exchange. So to know who you should talk to, uh, who is in, what is important to know, what kind of problems you envisage are things that you should all think in advance and 
uh, if you don't, then you bump into it um, as you uh, enter the enter the domain. Local knowledge and tradition can you uh, help you overcome some of these problems if you take them seriously, but also if you know how to recognize them. What is actually local knowledge? And how do you tell, say, experts from charlatans uh, when you look for gate gatekeepers? How do you know who is really in authority? And do you think that perceptions play a role in humanitarian action or uh, emergency response? That is uh, one thing that we are finding out in this project, how actually this perception and um, framing of the other has an input, an influence on uh, how we actually uh, identify others, uh, engage with others, respond to others. So after this presentation, which uh, based on a presentation that uh, Bram Janssen has uh, developed, uh, so the credit is due to, uh, to, to Bram, I give the floor to a wholly original presentation uh, by uh, Karen Engel, uh, who kindly uh, came here uh, to join the Educent team uh, uh, from Nigeria, actually, where she lives, uh, but uh, more uh, recently from, uh, from the province of Limburg. And uh, I'm looking uh, forward to her presentation. And after this presentation, there's time for questions and uh, particular uh, talking points that hopefully you also uh, contribute to. Thank you very much. Okay, this is very strange because normally I'm in a setting where you have actual interaction with people. <laughs> Okay, are there um, no questions? Because I would, I don't know, like I would like to know kind of like, I can go everywhere. Like this. You know, culture is very broad. Uh, culture and disasters is very broad. Uh, you can talk about a lot of different things. People uh, encompass different cultures. Uh, there's not just one culture that really defines you or that guides you. There's a lot of them. Uh, depending on the situation, you will uh, prefer one over the other. So I don't know if there's anything that can kind of that I can include into my presentation so that I actually uh, so that I can actually also um, include your questions so that I'm sure that whatever you want to hear is actually also uh, presented. Is there anything specific? Any questions regarding, for example, disaster subcultures? Disaster management is all. All right. Well, then I guess I'll start. Um, okay. This will maybe there is a little bit of overlap with uh, what Jeroen said. Some other things will be new, useful, hopefully useful. Um, the first thing, obviously, there's a lot of like I also said, culture is very broad. I mean, essentially, it started out as something like everything that you know we do um as people as communities to accommodate to a specific social setting environmental setting. Uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of different definitions um, over the years people have approached it from different angles people have looked at how people dance people have looked at how people dress themselves uh people have been in communities i mean there's there, there's a lot of different approaches that have uh, gone before us um, not, however, always as practical because a lot of it has been observing um, and culture is very complex. So when working with culture, before I started doing my PhD, I worked in, uh, more in, in the field of disaster management as a consultant. And uh, particularly in Holland, I worked with floods and water because water is a very important element of Dutch society. and if you pay attention to culture and you pay attention to your environment, you will see that wherever you go, you see the way the Dutch interact with water. Um, if you, for instance, if you're flying over Holland and you look down, you see pretty much all of the different waterways. And you'll also see how everything is controlled. It's a man-made environment. And that man-made environment is guided by certain cultural principles. One of them, for instance, a lot of the people will know the Delta Works. The Delta Works are 
in my idea, a very, uh, a very complex technical artifact, which is also its material culture, which if you interpret it, if you look at it, and if you take it into the into the whole Dutch society, you will see it's a very definitive one because it represents engineering. And if you look at the way the Dutch deal with water, it's a very uh, it's an engineered resilience. It's enabling stability, ensuring that flooding will never ever happen again. If you take this approach to another country, like let's say Bangladesh, uh, it will not work. One, because the resources are simply not there. And two, because the resources are not there, people have a different approach towards dealing with the water that they live with. So it's very definitive for Holland. However, can you just transport it to another situation? No, you cannot, because the basic, the logic on which it is based is very Dutch. So the moment also you start, you, you cannot just simply transfer any kind of, of these different cultural uh, artifacts. You have to pay attention. Where are you going towards? And what problem is this solving? In Holland, it works somewhere else. Might not. At any rate, so working with uh, with flooding and with disaster management, it became very apparent that you know the the the, the natural environment is very uh, influences the you know influences culture and vice versa. Um, so the way that I define culture, which has been useful in my work, has been a more practical, pragmatic way. And that's essentially that culture encompasses strategies, practices that communities turn to when dealing with certain challenges or opportunities. Uh, culture emerges, cultural elements emerge when a certain environment is, or a certain society within a social or environmental, uh, natural environment is confronted with a certain challenge or, or potentially also opportunity. And they collectively decide we have to do something with it. And that's when they start producing culture. So even if, you know, a lot of the times we see culture as dresses um, or specifically more aesthetic for aesthetic purposes, oftentimes they actually have a very functional purpose. They are very functional. They are essentially the, an assemblage, um, a pool of resources that communities turn to, to encounter or to deal with a certain situation. So the Delta works hope a lot of people will know, uh, they serve a specific purpose. They were created and they, uh, they were created to keep the water out, which is a specific value, you know, keeping everything, keeping the land dry, uh, protecting so that people can continue their life in a peaceful manner. Preventing is better than curing, which is also a very Dutch principle. This is all represented within these Delta works. That is why we positioned those and we invested in it. Uh, it's very expensive. But also now, if you start wondering, for example, about climate change and the possible uh, challenges that that will bring, that is very difficult to potentially discuss within a Dutch setting when you very much believe in engineering and you believe in the capacities of human reason. Um, human reason, you know, this might be an attitude, I'm not saying it is, but it might be an attitude that human reason will conquer. So we are not concerned, we are not, you know, whatever we have created will be sufficient and if not then we put our engineers into it and then we will you know uh, solve the solution and we will be able to prevent whatever happens we will maintain stability but what happens then when um, when something unexpected happens there will not be any cultural assets that will actually enable people or societies to deal with these unexpected events because you're used to a very stable society um so Culture really emerges when a society finds something problematic. This is when people have to start talking and when they actually have to start collectively producing something. Um, and at the same time, then, culture is a pool of resources. That is, culture is what people do. Culture is what people have. Uh, so in times of emergencies, especially, this is what people will go towards. So if, for instance, as an emergency organization, you look at the people and you wonder why the hell are these people going that way when I told them to go that way? That is a very, that is the question that you have to ask yourself. Why do people prefer, why do they value this route better than the other one? Apparently, whatever solution you have provided is not valuable to the society you're dealing with. Um, it might be, however, the communication there has a, a 
can be then being effective and you have to start understanding why is my solution is it appropriate for uh, the, their situation and if uh, people are not actually doing it that means that they're not definitely not seeing the value of whatever solution you're providing them so in that sense it's essential for disaster management and disaster eventually also disaster risk reduction to look at what do people do and why do they do them and in chile for instance it's internationally it's often uh, recommended if there's an earthquake for people to stay in place and not necessarily go out because statistically there internationally there has been uh, there are a lot of people that get hurt in the process of trying to get out of the building in chile generally um, a magnitude seven earthquake is not necessarily worth evacuating the building for because everyone knows it will most likely not cause a lot of damage houses the infrastructure the material infrastructure is built to withstand it um so people could potentially if they decided to uh, stay in their building however they do not why do they not because it has been culturally they have learned that it is valuable to flee so independent of whatever international agencies would be saying you have to stay they will flee especially with the magnitude seven because they know historically speaking that a magnitude seven earthquake might potentially lead towards a bigger one it might be a foreshock of the actual main shock which can cause a lot of damage within the within the country and this has resulted for instance in a reduced uh, death toll of the 1960 earthquake which was a magnitude 9.5 the actual earthquake did not result in a lot of deaths. While this earthquake is essentially the, the biggest one ever recorded. And it also enabled uh, in a few other instances where it was also, uh, where earthquakes are also, uh, in, in certain other inc instances, that it also enabled people to indeed uh, to flee and to stay outside, they, they generally stay outside and it has saved them a lot. So if then an international organization would go there and would see this practice, they would more likely say, you should not do this. However, for the specific context that you're dealing with, it might be a valuable practice that they should keep upkeep because it has resulted in less deaths. So these are things that you might encounter and that are also uh, important to take into account because this is essentially what happens. Any kind of disaster will be local. So any kind of resources that they will turn to have to be local and will therefore most likely be cultural. Um, uh, let's see. Are there any questions? No. Okay, so then I just quickly do this. Is there someone who wants to ask a question? Ah, great. Um, I can take all evening if you want. <laughs> Someone has to uh, tell me. How much time do I have left? No, but let's say five minutes. No, okay, okay. Um, okay, so so essentially what I'm trying to say is the different cultural elements that a community has, these are the resources that they will turn to. Um, if, for instance, uh, in Chile, you will notice that um, where so I'm doing my research in Chile. I am half Chile. Uh, the, the main organizations to deal with disasters and they have or hazards as they and they have quite a few from volcanoes to earthquakes to tsunamis, etc., is informal. So if you start looking at the formal structures, which for instance you have in Holland, which you might have in the United States, where the formal organizations are very important and you take this lens and you put it on the Chilean situation, you will not see anything. You will think that these people are absolutely incapable of dealing with an actual disaster. If you look at the actual results, you know that then in 2000, they had a major uh, earthquake and a tsunami. Compared to Haiti, the impact is actually quite minor. There was absolutely no collapse. In certain communities, um, the impact was very minimal. In a few days, they were up and running again. Um, the ones that were affected by the tsunami, they uh, they obviously had more material damage. However, if you really talk to them, the impact is still minimal. So then you have to wonder. So something is absorbing all of this impact, and most of the things that 
enable them to observe that are the different pools of research that they have enabled, that they have developed over time and that are essentially cultural resources. So to come in uh, with a view of, oh, you have absolutely nothing, and you start, you're not actually looking at what is the situation. You're looking with a certain model that does not fit the reality. And I'm pretty sure that in a lot of the different countries, also like even in small countries like Holland, you will notice that uh, per region, when more urbanized, most likely more complex, more division of labor, um, there will be more people that even, for instance, will look uh, when there's an emergency or will seem incompetent, maybe um, passive. Uh, but this makes sense because they have organized. Uh, they have the different organizations, professional organizations, to deal with certain things. In a more rural setting, you don't necessarily have all of these specific professionalized organizations. So you will notice that people will start doing whatever they want to do. Uh, in an urban setting, most likely they will also. However, it might take more time because they have to reassemble the, the world around them. It doesn't make any sense anymore when the organizations are not there that are supposed to be there. So to, for a long time, Culture is often excluded because it is very messy. It's not very clear. I mean, sure, it's very clear to talk about music, to talk about the art. Uh, yeah, those are very obvious cultural elements. However, and those can, by the way, also give you a lot of information of what people would potentially do or how they perceive or how they value certain facts or events and how, therefore, you might have to uh, <coughs> do disaster management. But um, it goes more, it, it goes beyond that because it's essentially everything that guides people. Uh, it guides behavior, it guides what you value. So the minute you ignore all of this, what are you working with? You're maybe you're imposing a certain model or structure on top of something that most likely doesn't work. So we are trying in the disaster, uh, in the disaster research, let's say, to look more at culture and try to make it more visible and for a lot of people especially when well this is something that i'm trying to do in chile for a lot of people it's very strange because they're asking me like why do you find this interesting what i'm doing because it's very normal but that's essentially what it is it's what do you find normal so in practical terms if you're working and you find something out of the ordinary you find something not normal most likely you're dealing with different cultural logic so try to understand try to go into the data and try to see why is this person doing this I live in Nigeria. Most often, you know, you really wonder why do people do it this way. Uh, one thing is, especially if there are, if you actually have an objective to attain, uh, you could potentially just get really angry and say, "Why are you not being reasonable, or why are you not, you know, logical like I am?" Or you can try and understand the logic behind it and see why do people do it and adjust to their system, because that's the system where you're trying to get results. So I think I'm going to leave it at that, if there's any questions. Please ask. <laughs> oh, yeah. Does anybody want to chip in? I was thinking of... Um, trying to think of an example of a group which we do not normally see as a culture, but that you could think about attributes that you what you can expect from their attitude with respect to disaster risk. And that group is tourists. Um, I'm relying on research of a student uh, called Yalmar, which uh, he did his thesis with us and went to New Zealand to see how holiday makers were prepared for disasters in Z New Zealand. And New Zealand has rather a lot of those, uh, from storms to volcanoes to uh, earthquakes. And it turned out that people don't prepare, basically. When they're on holiday, their attitude to risk is, hey, it's a holiday. Who cares about risk? Uh, we're here to enjoy. We don't want anything negative. So if you want to communicate uh, earthquake risk to a holiday makers, you have a heavy task on your hand which is heavier than for uh, someone who is at work or who has young children that they feel protected towards and so on. To, can I add? Yeah, sure. 
because with tourists, we often think of uh, obviously people uh, from outside the country that might not even know the country. In Chile, one of the uh, the most most of the victims from the most of the tsunami victims were internal tourists, were national tourists. They were people from Santiago, where they have a more Santiago is very inland. Uh, they have an inland culture. They do not have a sea culture. So these people did not know how to interpret their environment and did not evacuate from the ship. Most of the local communities, they did. So this is, I mean, if you're like talking, I mean, this is even, I mean, you're talking about Santiago, which is not that far. Most of these people were maybe two hours away from their town along the coast. They did not have the sufficient, they were not part of the disaster subculture that was prevalent yeah. in the coastal communities. So even a tourist, just driving two hours, you might be already being dangerous. So their, their situational awareness, as it were, is, is very low. Uh, people often don't know and don't really care where they are, except where their accommodation is and uh, if they have internet. Well, in a disaster often for internet will be the first to go because there will be no, no electricity access. Um, people often also in touristic situations live in the substandard accommodation. Their uh, temporary accommodation, like tents, caravans, uh, in case of festivals, uh, there may be all kinds of uh, makeshift uh, uh, things that are good enough for a festival, but not good enough to withstand a heavy storm. A couple of years back, we had several festival-related disasters uh, in Belgium, Netherlands, and uh, in Germany, as I remember, uh, that uh, made victims or caused, uh, caused a lot of damage and panic um, because people did not really know where they were and they were in things that could fall, that could break, uh, that would not break or fall at home because they have more sturdy roofs over their heads and more sturdy materials to work with. Um, since we talked about that disaster and perception is related to each other, I think one of the things when looking at culture is also to imagine not only how we look at them, so in this case, tourists as people who empirically are found to be less responsible in their preparation, but also how they look at us, as in, in this case, probably as fussy and overly apocalyptic, because, hey, it's a holiday, so we want to be in a good mood. Which means that they're probably also less open to suggestions, to orders, unless you find ways of uh, reaching core values, things, survival instincts and stuff. So. It is possible to have a strategy in advance towards uh, towards tourists as a group, although people have different age and gender and um, ethnic characteristics and religious beliefs and whatever. As a group of tourists, they're likely to be more or less bracketable in into one uh, particular group, particular attributes that we need to be prepared for. Um, this is one of the things that uh, I was that came to mind when I started thinking about culture, because we always talk about cultures as problems, like migrants or refugees or uh, as, as curiosities, people uh, exotic. But actually, there are also groups that can be seen as cultures, as uh, target groups with specific aspects, specific ways of behaving, and specific expressions um, that we do not. And that could be quite helpful also in a disaster risk reduction uh, context. Another group that, that came to mind are doomsday preppers. They are the people who uh, are overly prepared, you could say, in the sense that they their house is full of stuff, um, food, um, water, um, tools, uh, because they think that the disaster can happen any day. Even though there is no physical science scientific evidence for that, this is what they believe, or that there may be a space invasion. And there are quite some people who believe in that um, for various uh, different reasons. So they are, you could say they're too panicky. They're overly concerned, the, the exact opposite of the, the careless uh, tourist. But they also have technical skills. They, they, have, they know how to to have, have, they have studied how to behave in a, uh, a disaster situation. And so if one happens, they bring technical and organizational skills that, that others may not have. So here's another group 
an identity group because uh, doomsday preppers may be loners, but often they know each other uh, and, and exchange tips. So it it's, it's, could also be one group to work with if there are doomsday preppers in your area uh, that you may not uh, have thought of. Um, that could be quite useful in disaster preparation. And especially if you take away the pinches of salt of their disaster uh, awareness and focus on the things that they, they have to bring, it uh, could be a cultural asset. Here's an example, two examples to tourists as probably less aware people and the doomsday preppers as probably more aware people that we could treat as disaster cultures. I hope all this made sense and I hope that um, you get uh, some responses. in India and well you talked about the careless tourists in in 2010 when there was a, the disaster floods in Ladakh um, many trekkers got caught in this flood and most tourists that come to Ladakh see only the high deep scene and cannot imagine that in a desert as such that can be flooding and they you know they attracted the emergency response they uh, Helicopters of the army had to be mobilized to pick up them when they have, could have been mobilized to uh, people in the villages and local communities had to take care of these stories that got lost while they were same affected. So it uh, it kind of it has a serious impact. And, um, and because you talked about preparedness, I thought about my own experience because I was looking at how do people uh, cope with uh, changes and cope with disasters uh, in this ecosystem. And most of the time people did not have the idea of preparing for a disaster. It may be because disaster is a new thing for them and maybe there is a lack of memory of disasters from the past. But when um, some local, um, local representative of the communities had the idea of um, building, building a hard structure for facilitating the, the evacuation of people who usually go in the mountain on the dry shade to uh, to hide. Uh, he thought about the idea of building a room that could be used for some of other purposes. And he really encountered strong resistance from other members of the community because the simple idea of preparing for a disaster event would, as I quote, as I quote it would be bad omen for them because you consider it might happen, then it might actually happen or it might even be stronger because you prepared for it. And um, I think this is very important when you communicate about preparedness and disaster, how you make your friends, how do you present it to communities and the phrasing you use uh, doesn't. Yeah, this is uh, also one place where, where, where I would like to just, just say some last words. Um, because indeed, like one of the things, like we have to realize that disaster management, disaster preparedness, disaster risk reduction, these are very, uh, these are Western practices. Um, if you if you start looking at indeed the world in general, and most of them live in rural communities or they live in urban sectors, etc., but they're, they're dealing with their lives, um, they might not be doing disaster risk reduction as we are doing it. They might not have the cycle with the preparedness. But they are doing a lot of things. So, like I was saying, also in, in Chile, like most of them, like if you look from the formal, this formal, uh, this formal lens of you know, are you doing any preparation, prevention, you will find absolutely nothing. However, if you really start looking at what people are doing, and that is the essence, I think, because people are always dealing with hazards. So even when you encounter indeed, like it's a bad omen, this particular uh, belief. It's serving some purpose. So the minute you start dismissing this uh, particular belief, some, you're breaking something else. So you have to see like what is this? What is the purpose of believing this? Because for a lot of people, it might, for instance, be you know if you're living in a very variable environment where a lot happens, and um, this idea of actually, uh, it, this idea of actually being able to intervene and engage with your natural environment and controlling something might not be there. And it might actually serve the purpose for them to be more flexible, creative, and improvised. So when 
you know, for, for me, the, the, the value lies always in try and see what is there. This is, these are resources and they have a certain specific purpose. So don't just come in with, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to be prepared. You need to have this. You need to have that. Because one, they might be prepared, but maybe in a different way than you have actually envisioned. Something that might not, you know, that we might not have encountered, but what does actually serve the, the social and environmental setting? Because the social setting is also very important. So the moment you, for instance, say it's much more important to build a dam than to, uh, you know, while this will actually break down the social, uh, the social networks that are within the community, these social networks will be necessary to start rebuilding. Um, again, maybe to a small example in, uh, um, for from Nigeria, uh, there's some, uh, you know, if a person die is dying or has a terminal illness, most likely they will be paying church they will go out of the hospital and they will start going paying the church for whatever they start giving them a lot of money everything they have essentially. now you might think well that's stupid you know i mean there you have the university of the, the hospital they have all the different te technical whatever thingies to make his life uh, uh, so to make his life uh, to make his life better and maybe potentially he can live a day more maybe he can live a week more but then this person is not necessarily thinking about his own life probably most likely thinking about the people he's leaving behind. And when this person is especially a man, uh, will die, most likely the church will be the actual, the social, the social resources. They, they will be the ones that will be able to take care of the family, they will be able to organize the whole funeral. And so what is at that point more important? The, all the technical and scientific knowledge that has the, the hospital or leaving your family and everyone you have uh, behind in a proper manner. So in this sense, you know, always try that culture has a purpose. It's not just there to be annoying. It's there because people get a value out of it. This does not mean that it cannot change. And this does not mean that some, you know, adding or adapting this culture uh, is not necessary. It might be. However, it will take time. And for people to actually change their culture, they will have to find, they will have to see the need. If they do not find the need, if they do not see the, you know, yeah, it will be valuable because indeed, you know, then my interest will indeed be better covered. If they do not see this need, they were not going to change. If they do not see that someone's solution will actually enable them to uh, to preserve their to to, to uh, account for their needs, they're not going to change. Anything. So the last thing. I have a question actually, <laughs> um, because you were um, talking about how. When do you know you're dealing with culture, and that it's often um, the case when you encounter a clash or a contrast, or when you see things and you think hmm, that's different from normal. Uh, but how can you encounter your own culture? Because for well, for me, my culture is normal, so I won't see it. And in a lot of disaster, well, for a lot of responders, I think it's very valuable they know about their own culture uh, so you have an idea <laughs> it's true and this is actually a very good question because uh, because this is also what makes culture difficult the fact that indeed for you most likely for you it's it, it's your automatic pilot it's how you deal with life for you very normal and most likely another person will find it strange. So, you know, for one, you know, having, asking yourself, I think most, the most practical thing that you can, that you can put into practice is really just questioning. And it's not very philosophical, but just why do I do this? Why do I have a plan? Why do I need this plan? Why does someone else not have a plan? Why can they still work? What is improv? How do you define things? And these are, you know, why do I do it this way and not the other way when the other way can potentially be cheaper? Or not? Why do I value what I do? But at the same time, just be aware that you might also not necessarily want to know certain things about your own culture. You know, because they are, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's what you value. It's, it's what you find important. And, and the minute you start questioning that, that can also, you know, take your own life. Well, uh, can I 
-hmm. from what yeah, you just sure. said because you've now and um, taken a kind of individualistic answer to that like uh, introspection no, which is very useful but also collectively as an organization you, can, you have to there's also intervision with colleagues and you can make a routine of asking these questions in a in a group as it were which probably usually more heads know more than, than one oh yeah and i would definitely say like ask i mean when you you know in this philosophical sense like if you're in an organization you will also have a certain so you know together they start questioning why do we do it the way we do yeah why do we act like that and as you say that can be quite confrontational um in your earlier answer you gave some examples from nigeria from chile which is or northern european uh quite nice to see as a contrast but of course we can see it closer home first of all there are a lot of refugees now coming into europe so we are confronted by others who are different but also see us as different and maybe not as different as we thought usually there's a lot of protests of people coming as refugees especially to local smaller communities that feel overwhelmed but then when they have to leave people say don't go because we just started to get to know you so this is an example of the interaction between cultures which also leads to different framing of each other different reality making of each other but even closer to home, to go back to, to Mona's question, is um, people really in, in, in the West too are not happy to talk about bad things that could happen because they feel from a kind of superstition that we may all share. It is talking about it is kind of willing it to happen. In, in my family, you didn't talk about death or, or, or serious disease because if you talked about it, it almost felt like it, it, it was more likely to, to befall you. And the same goes all kinds of knock on wood and four leaf clover and all kinds of examples that is also the, uh, uh, reflected in our own um, uh, Edison uh, logo, this four leaf clover, uh, not for nothing. It's one of the reasons why, why I like it because exactly it's this kind of beliefs that we have, which we may not even want to admit our superstitious, but of course they are. Um, we think that they will bring us luck. Uh, religious people may set a lot of store by prayer. And if you say to them, yeah, that doesn't, that's not gonna help you, then you upset their beliefs that makes a part of who they are, of, of their identity. Also and interestingly, sometimes these things that we talked earlier actually seem to help uh, that people, and like, um, faith healers or people who have specific uh, gifts may accomplish things that we would not th think as possible and we would dismiss as as, as uh, charlatanism or as, as uh, superstition it's it's I come back to a question that I asked before is how do you tell the wheat from the chaff how do you see people who are really have special things to to give them cultural practices that are very useful and cultural practices that are distracted, destructive or individuals that pretend to be cultural experts but turn out to be frauds? Well, from, from my perspective, I, I, would, I would see it slightly different because, I mean, we see this, uh, the charlatan. Like sometimes they have different functions that are not necessarily, like we see like, okay, you have a doctor and a charlatan. The doctor is supposed to heal you. A charlatan cannot necessarily does not might not have necessarily the function of healing. I mean, all of these different uh, cultural elements that different cultures have, they, they 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 serve different purposes. Like I said, like the religion uh, or the church, a church might provide you know you functional you might think you know they give you I don't know guidance guidance in the way. You, God created the world and how you should live, etc. But it also is so much more. It's also an institution. There's also people. It's network. It's you get so much more out of it. So in that sense, the first thing I would potentially do, not necessarily thinking, hey, what is the rubbish? The the things that you will encounter will most likely serve an important purpose for this community. And so first thing is, what? Why are? Why is this person here? And why do people apparently value this person, even if it's, you know, might sound like rubbish in, in our perception and, and what a person should, 
should do. And then start seeing, is this valuable? Is this truly? So the same with, you know, these different superstitions. Like for people, especially in, in certain circumstances where, you know, you are living with a lot of variability, you know, it might best to just, you know, believe in God and say, you know, what happens, what happens, and otherwise we'll deal with it. And it was, yeah. you know, it, it might also give them strength. So to immediately dismiss it as something, oh, it's spiritual, and it's, you know, then you're also taking away the strength, which is actually might be a foundation of something new. So I would always try and find, wh what is the purpose? Why do people die? Mm -hmm. I agree, and I start to enjoy the whole conversation, but I don't want to exclude our um, patient uh, participants. So in, you're still very welcome to chip in and uh, knock on the door through sending a chat uh, in the chat function if you want to make a comment or a, a question. Now to pick up where you left off, um, of course, we talk about this, this interface between um, responder, whether voluntary or professional responder, trained responder, um, or so-called victim, or a victim can, doesn't have to be a passive victim. And let's say that one of, one of those are a, a religious and the other are not, or they are from totally different religions. Um, I know that in, in certain Catholic areas, in the south of Italy, for example, People see the, the Virgin Mary as a kind of part of the family who's closer to God than all of us. So if they want something, if they need something, if they feel, uh, feel a, a, a need for certain aid, they are more likely to, to, to pray or to look for spiritual guidance than to call the police or the uh, fire brigade or uh, other kind of professional responders. Is that bad? Um, you can say we should mm -hmm. respect religion for what it is, for what it means to people. You don't want to take away their their ontological security, what they feel safe and at home with, their part of their identity by trying to explode what you might see as a myth or as a as a fallacy. But then does it make it better? Does it, but they do make it better. Well, in this sense, um, I mean, essentially, this is a reality. So if you are a professional organization and you do actually want to work within such communities and with these people, I think the only way to do it is by acknowledging and respecting uh, that which enables their survival. Because they will also, I mean, at one point, and especially as an emergency organization, you come in and you leave. And you're leaving them behind. So there's a very short intervention and if in that intervention, you know, you leave them worse off by, for example, because one of the strongest and one of the most important capacities that a human being has to, and a, and a community has to recover is, is cognition, is the mind. I mean, this is what enables a certain inte you know, integrity when all the material world breaks down. If you start breaking down these yeah, intelligible uh, means that people have, to, then you leave people behind worse off. And I definitely would wonder whether that would be something that you want to do. Uh, so in that sense, whenever you're when you're preparing, as also a professional organization, and this is also something that we, that you mentioned earlier, everything we do has to be prepared because at the moment of an emergency, and everyone that works in emergency will know, this is when you start going to your your automatic pilot. You just do you do what you're trained in, and if you have an agile organization you will look into creativity improv but you cannot cognitively you do not have a lot of cognitive room to solve difficult problems or to encounter and be questioning oh the culture is this something that is can we you go into the discussion slow, eh? nah. you, have to, you can only think fast you have to do and, and and that makes sense so and you will hurt i mean there will be harm but indeed trying to do this before try to get to know what the, what is the community that i'm dealing with if you don't know, if you're coming in because it's a centralized organization, you come in, try indeed to find, and you will notice immediately where people, you know, like certain key uh, key characters that will know, ask them, engage with them, and try and see, and try to build and work on top of what they have, because they often do have a lot. And there's often a lot of different uh, organizations, uh, a lot of different communities. I mean, this, this is a professional organization, so they only do a very limited 
amount of the work. Most of the work is always done by the local people who eventually have to recover, they have to rebuild, they have to, you know, continue living where they are. So I would say not ignore it and build up build with it because you might end up dead and living there. You can be doing that. <laughs> have one more question for you. Um, and that is, I mean, I introduced you, Karen, as PhD student, but before you started as a PhD student, you had a professional life as a crisis researcher in this uh, so-called uh, COT in, in Leiden University. And I, in that capacity, you evaluated a crisis exercise, a flood exercise, which was not only a desktop exercise, but actually some real life role play uh, action with people in uniforms uh, from different countries different cultures and that's of course why i'm interested in this particular case not just organizational cultures but also national cultures try to work together to respond in a scenario way to a flood in the north of the netherlands yeah. how is culture important here pluses and its minuses well this also reminds me of uh it triggers a, a few experiences that I had as a researcher then. Regarding the, the actual exercise, you noticed immediately when we were talking, we, uh, we had the UK involved, Poland, Belgium, and Holland, and Germany, I think it was, and maybe also a little bit of Spain. Um, and all of them came together in the north of Holland to indeed uh, recreate a flooding situation in the flood scenario. And they would all come and help. And it was really quite interesting, although obviously at the end everyone said everything went really well and there were you know, a few lessons learned you know, regarding most likely regarding communication and coordination, but those are always difficult areas. Uh, the important elements were one between different organizations, also from within a country. Uh, a military organization will be very different, at least in Holland. I'm talking about now like the, the, the Dutch civil service. The military is very different to the to the civil services, which is, for example, the, the fire department. The fire department is considered here. Uh, it's, it's, it's a civil organization in a sense. They're not military. So if, for instance, you have a conference with military guys and the fire department, the military will be in uniform. The fire people will most likely be in suits. They're civil servants, so to say, which is different than that. But at any rate, so <clears throat> what you notice in this exercise between the two, at one point we were uh, there was talk about a possible uh, flooding of okay you have you have one uh, you have one province in Holland which is which is created which was man-made and it has two main cities it's it's essentially it's um, it's a hole in the water it's you know we pump the water out and we we have land. And there's two cities, and you can uh, you can put a dam in between, and that will save one of the cities, depending on where the flooding is. At one point in time, decisions civil uh, civilians had to take the decision of what are we going to do because they are responsible. And you notice that the military was taking over slowly because these are militaries that are that, that they had a little civil military uh, cooperation, but they're not used to very long and lengthy decision making processes. So they were actually at that point. <laughs> They were slowly but surely trying to take over the decision-making process. Well, obviously, all the others were not necessarily agreed, but they could potentially. And we actually we pondered this. Like at one point, like if there would actually be an emergency, most likely they will, independent of all the civilians. Like they will be like, okay, this is taking too long. We're going to do it like this. So this is something that I also, for example, encountered in a, a search and rescue mission of the Dutch in Pakistan. One of the problems was, again, was the, 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 the working methods between military and civilians, the fire department. They were both there, they were in the same camp, but the military is used whenever they go on a mission, uh, whenever they, it, the mission is you leave home, you're in a mission. You come back home with your family, that's the end of the mission. For the fire, it's, uh, at least in Holland, the missions are very, like they go, like you go to a fire and you come back. You go to another fire and you come back and like so your base is essentially the fire station so in pakistan when they were actually when they were working the fire department whenever they would come back to the to their camp this is when they would relax they would have a cup of coffee you know they would chill 
all the military things. What the hell are these guys doing? You know, we're still on a mission. We have to work. It's like working 24-7 until you come home. That's when you start getting your family together. And this can cause a lot of friction. So even within the, the same culture, technically they're Dutch, they speak the same language, but they're very different organizational culture, which can cause a lot of, of issues when you're actually in the field. So, yeah, this is just a few examples of an example. I was, um, I don't know, is Helena still here? Yes, <laughs> because you joined the exercise last week um, in Markham, the village, the big blood exercise, and there was also involvement of the military. And I was wondering, did you see similar things happen between the military and uh, other organizations? And uh, if not, is it just, did it just go really well? Or was there maybe uh, something that should be different in an ex exercise to find those kind of frictions? Oh, your laptop is crashing, I'm sorry. So Helena would like to talk to us, but her techno technology is not uh, <laughs> Of helpful. course, you're always <coughs> welcome to, uh, I believe you would. You were going to share your observations anyway. So we are looking forward to those. And uh, well, I'm curious to hear uh, what you think. <laughs> Thank you. So people with uh, still working crash, uh, non-crashed non uh, laptops, um, Mona or others, would you want to make a, I would say, a final question or remark? Some people already left, so if there are no questions, I think we will. We'll close this session, which... Uh, hope it was helpful. <laughs> hope it was helpful and yeah. uh, certainly uh, entertaining for us. Yes. Um, and we will uh, share the we will share the recordings of the um, of the webinar and people who have questions um, so who didn't join but with questions because they watched the recordings they're always welcome to send them to us to share them and we will try to answer them. And just a reminder that uh, on the seventeenth uh, we are going to have our second uh, webinar. Um, which we will advertise to a slightly larger group. Um, it will be on disaster and disability, and the main keynote will come from our Edison project member, uh, participant consortium member, Charlar Agungur from the search and rescue organization in Istanbul called Akut. Um, he will be talking about the Turkish experience with uh, involving people with disabilities in disaster risk reduction. Again, not us, only us, as difficult or strange or unusual target groups for uh, one size fits all disaster risk reduction, but as people with their own abilities and group culture and languages. So that's on the 17th, um, that's Thursday week, uh, a week from now. The 17th again on uh, this same time slot, three to five uh, in the afternoon, and we hope you will join us again and also spread the word uh, to, so that we will have a, a wider group uh, of participants. Thank you for your attention, and we're looking forward to seeing you, meeting you again as soon uh, digitally in the next uh, webinar. Thank you and good night.